You're watching the Embassy of God program. Thank you very much that we have you. If we have 10 more people like him, then everything would change. May God give birth to 10 more people like him. This is a man that God is, I think God has sovereignly brought to this country to, to spark something that's just, it's unique. It's never, it's never happened before. I don't think we've ever seen anything like it in this country before, maybe in Europe before. In you something. Maybe the other, way the other people didn't know. <laughs> Pastor Sunday, there is a blind man here. He doesn't see. You can you can walk, right? He doesn't see anything. Can you pray? Start to see what you could not see before. Sunday Adelaja is regarded as one of the youngest and most effective church leaders in the world. His church in Kiev, the Ukraine, counts over 20,000 believers. Ex-communists, criminals, drug addicts, and top business people attend his church. At present, Adelaja's church has started over 30 rehabilitation centers for alcohol and drug addicts and feed over 2,000 homeless people a day. Before he reached his present success, he first had to overcome several obstacles and endure many conflicts. Who is Sunday Adelaja? And why did he succeed where others didn't even dare to try? In 1986, Sunday leaves Nigeria to study journalism in Belarus, Russia. In those days, the Russians weren't very accustomed to seeing African people. I came in in 1991, you know, and things were already getting better. But he came in 86, and there were people who came in the 1970s, you know. Then, of course, they had fewer uh, black-skinned people, and to them, you know, it was a mystery, you know. Somebody even asked me one day, is it true that it was when you go to Moscow that your tail was cut off like monkey? So they thought we were having tails, and uh, they were cut off in Moscow with oppression, and we were giving clothing for the first time. Uh, which was uh, very ridiculous, but to me, that was not too annoying, because I just see it as a result of ignorance, but many other Africans who go into fighting and quarreling and getting annoyed. And when they call them monkey in the streets and they laugh at them, people get mad. But I never got mad. I always used to say, well, if people laugh because I'm black, because they see me, at least I give them some source of joy. Sunday Adolaja grew up in Idomila, Nigeria. At the age of 17, he has a supernatural experience that changes his life completely. I was watching a television program. Uh, and I heard that God was waiting for me all these years and that he was not waiting for me to judge me, as I thought. He was waiting for me to forgive me. I couldn't believe it. So I decided to give it a try. When I repented of my sins in my room by myself, and, you know, I just felt that about 200 kilograms of weight dropped from my shoulder. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the street immediately afterwards and I felt like saying greetings to everybody I met in the streets, even if I never met them before, even if I didn't know them. And I was determined to go to, to, the, to the end of the world, to let everybody know that this God is real. Communist rule prevails when Sunday arrives in white Russia. Only the state-controlled church is tolerated. All other religions are prohibited. Without any reason, you could be deported or even face a prison sentence if you were involved in other religious activities. Because Nigerian government uh, provides scholarships for people who are finishing high school, so I applied for Nigerian scholarship 
to, so they would tell you to choose any country, three countries of the world. And one of the countries I chose was Russia. I went to Russia originally to study journalism because the Russian government, they award scholarship to uh, have people of developing countries so that they could go back to their countries and do uh, communist revolution. So uh, the communist people wanted me to go to Russia, study communism, and go back to Africa to do socialist revolution or communist revolution. But God overturned their plan. This was an extremely difficult period in Sunday's life. When Sunday's religious activities came under the attention of his fellow students, they warned him by saying, you'd better hide your Bible at the bottom of your suitcase and only remove it once you're back in Nigeria. God does not exist here. You are putting yourself at unnecessary risk. Despite their warnings, Sunday decides not to hide his faith. I had put uh, the picture of Jesus, the portrait of Jesus, just over my bed. So one evening, just after classes, I heard a very big, I heard a very big bang on my door. And people were knocking so hard as if they were kicking the door with their legs. And uh, when I opened the door, and I just saw four men and one woman who was our curator, our dean, and uh, the, the secretary to the communist to the communist party, my roommate and one other man, I think, from the KGB. So they came in and they were pointing at the picture of Jesus and they were saying, what is this? I said, oh, don't you know what is this? Who is this? This is not what, this is the who. This is the picture of Jesus. And they said, well, we don't, we, don't, we don't care, we don't want to know what that is, but we just want to tell you you should remove it. If you don't remove it, you will be liable to punishment and penalty by our law. Start. Start. Because religious propaganda is, uh, it, it, it's punishable by law and you could go to prison. It's uh, Article number 35, they told me. So that was uh, what actually happened. My roommate had been writing some secret dossier on me, uh, which made the people, the communist party, to come. So as I was really frustrated and very angry that they would not, well, they would not allow me to practice my faith, uh, I could hear God say that, well, this is only the picture. If they would remove it from the wall, don't allow them to remove him from your heart. Sunday Adulaja completes his journalistic studies. The Berlin Wall falls, and communism in the Soviet Union is officially abdicated. Sunday begins to travel, speaking openly about the gospel. Despite the fall of communism, Sunday is still told to leave white Russia because of his Christian activities. They gave me ultimatum to leave the country of Belarus. Then uh, there was one day there was a call from Kiev, Ukraine, that says that they needed a journalist who speaks Russian very well and English very well. And uh, so that was when I went to Ukraine. We are in Kyiv, the, the capital city of uh, Ukraine, which is the new independent country. It used to be part of uh, the former Soviet Union. It used to be in the communist system. And uh, now freedom has come from communism after uh, the system collapsed and the Iron Curtain came down in 1990. So Ukraine has been an independent country. And right now, the country is trying to pick up and go to a market economy and also to build democracy. It's about the fourth or the fifth largest country in Europe with about 50 million population. So uh, it's a country to look up to. I met him 
when he just left Belarus, and when he just moved to the Ukraine. And in Ukraine then, it was very unpopular. It was just starting. It was not very established. He was having a television program. And when he proposed to me, and when we decided to get married, then it was at the stage when God was telling him to start the Bible studies, and when God was giving him the vision to start a church. I started to feel that God was telling me that the reason, the main reason he brought me to Belarus, I mean, from Belarus to Ukraine, was not just to uh, be a journalist, and that the greatest need of the Soviet people at that stage was not yeah, in journalists uh, or in journalism, journalism, but it was mainly in uh, in bringing the good news to them. I didn't want to marry a pastor, you know. I didn't want to marry a pastor. I just don't know why. I wanted to marry a businessman. I didn't want to be a minister myself, and I didn't want to marry a pastor. I want to have a normal home, you know. I don't want to have a religious home. I don't want to. I don't want to have close dealings with church. I told him blankly that I was not interested in a pastor. You know, I wanted a good life. I wanted a normal life. <laughs> I wanted a normal husband. You know, I didn't want a religious husband. So I began to pray, and I decided to fast and pray for intensively for some time. And it lasted for three months because I was asking many questions from God. I really wanted to be sure that he was the one asking me this time to speak in this church. I was, I was praying all night one day. I could hear his voice clearly that uh, he said I should start a church and he wants to start a church through me that will become a mega church. And at that stage, that was ridiculous in the former Soviet Union because the biggest church in my city that time was 700 people. And so, it's, it's, and God was talking to me about a church of 10,000 and be, and above. And so, I took faith to believe it. The secondary assignment was to raise up young men and women who could be trained and sent out as missionaries to the countries where the, the former Soviet Union used to send armament and uh, weapons of mass destruction that now God wants to turn it and these people, these Soviet Russian people, into people who bring hope and good news. I knew that I needed to begin to do something, but it now became a question of strategy, how to begin to do it. So I was a television producer and reporter, so I made an announcement over the television that anybody that wanted us uh, to study by the Bible should come. And so I give the address of my house. So we had seven people showed up. Natasha was one of the first people to arrive at Sunday's house. She was an alcoholic. I was breathless, I was listening, all ears. He was saying many, many things, you know? He was speaking not a good Russian at that time, but anyway, I was just, you know, just sitting there and I was watching him, how he was running, how he was telling something. I didn't understand a thing, but already I felt some joy inside. So they began to bring their friends and all that. Then in 1994, February, we proclaimed the church started. The people that showed up the first time really discouraged me. When the people began to come, they were ordinary people. They were simple people, or people mainly of drugs and of alcoholic uh, past. So they were former you know, alcoholics, and you know, they were looking very rigid and very old and very dejected and very, you know, very simple people who couldn't change anything in the society. So I got very disappointed. And I, I said, my God, you said people will come. I thought no more people would come. I thought teachers would come, or students would come, or you know, doctors would come, or just no more people would come. And my, personally, I never noticed alcoholics in the street. I never knew they were there, or alcohol, uh, drug addicts. I never noticed them. But here they were coming to me, and I didn't know what to do with them. 
God pointed me to read from uh, Mark 12, 37. The last part of it said in the Amplifier that the poor people and all the simple people, uh, the ordinary people, they felt good with Jesus. They, they, Jesus made them, to, the atmosphere of the presence of Jesus made them to feel good. And uh, so that really uh, ministered to my heart so deeply. I felt God was telling me that uh, if you can make them to feel good, if you can make the ordinary people, if you can be like Jesus, make the down and outs and the outcasts and the unlovables to be loved and welcomed in the church and to feel good around you, if I can trust you with them just like uh, I will take care of them, if you can really take care of them, then you will see that I will be able to trust you with the elite, with the rich with the powerful of the society. But if I cannot trust you with the rich and with the powerful, with the elite, if you will not be trusted with the down and outs and cast outs and ordinary people. Pastor Albert means now, as people started coming to Sunday's meetings, opposition was soon to rise. The government, the Orthodox Church, and the media began to criticize this church. We had a lot of publications, some TV programs, some publications, some articles in the newspaper. And what did they say? Saying bad things. Like, like, uh, past, like he plans to become the president of the country, that is destroying the tradition, is destroying the youth, that is making money out of the church, that is dealing with drugs, that he sells alcohol, you know, a lot of rubbish. But you, you know, you can't explain to everybody that it's not true, you know. So you need God, you know, to vindicate you. Uh, I was afraid that there might be physical hurt on him. I was afraid that some people might attack him because we also had, you know, like aggression that will kill you, something like that. And, you know, no matter what, all the same, he, he is my husband and I, I was a bit concerned. So I was afraid of physical harm. I was afraid that one day I, I will hear the, I will receive the news. I will hear the news that, you know, is dead or you know something bad has happened to him so i was like i was very concerned about that they you know say all kind of things and write all kind of negative articles in newspapers and saying that uh, this is a cult these people hypnotize and our people and they destroy our youth and they have come to occupy our country and they are agents of cia and all those kind of things when I see him pouring his heart, when I see him working hard, helping people, and then I see the other side of people, you know, like, like throwing stones at him. I mean, literally, not literally, and I see people not appreciating, you know, it hurts, you know. So that time I actually, I told him, I think we should leave this country, I told him. I, I understand that Ukraine is more developed than Nigeria, my country, but, but at least, you know, in Nigeria, at least, we, we, we are accepted, you know. We look like every other person. So maybe nobody paid that much attention to us. So, because, you know, these personality factors, it matters a lot. Everybody wants to be loved, and everybody wants to be respected, and everybody wants to be appreciated for the little things he does. In spite of all the opposition suffered by Sunday and his wife, they decide not to return to Nigeria, but to remain in the Ukraine. Their decision to stay is not in vain. The church begins to grow, and several projects are launched. Sunday helps homeless people find a new place in society. He pays a visit to one of his first projects, a rehabilitation center for the drug and alcohol addicted. Dimanche is one of the young men admitted to the rehabilitation center. 
He was previously admitted to several other clinics. I would use drugs for five and a half years. I would go under treatment. You know, they, they teach them how to be set free, but I didn't know how to live without drugs. But here what I liked is that they're teaching how to live without drugs. I really wanted to commit suicide. And as I cried out to God, I said, Lord, if you are there, stop this so the same day these people they they just took me and i like this atmosphere they love me the way i am just people coming to church uh getting saved we pray for them we discover that people get delivered uh, by the power of god of god but then they need to be restored to normal society they need to be taught how to behave they need to be taught how to be strong, how to hold on without the addiction they, used to, they are used to. And now then we discover we will need to have some uh, program uh, write, written out for them. So because Pastor Natasha used to drink for 30, 30 years, so she wrote out on the basis of the Bible the program, and which we decided to use, and it's been effective. Natasha, under the leadership of Sunday, now runs more than 30 different rehabilitation centers. We pay a visit to another center that started out of Sunday's church, situated in the forest outside of Kiv. The young men that have been admitted live on the premises and have previously tried different methods of rehabilitation. What do you tell them, Pastor Sunday, when they say, I can't, I can't? I tell, I tell them, don't even try. Because if you try to be free and to set yourself free, you can't, of course. There's no way you can. Nobody can himself. So you don't even need to try. What I tell them is that stop trying. When you begin to, tr when you stop to try, and you begin to depend on God, and just tell God, I cannot do it. You set me free. If you are God, you are interested in me. I want to be set free, but I cannot set myself free. Set me free, Lord. He will just do it so easily that you will not even need to struggle. That's why he said it's easy, because it's easy when God does it. That's a different mentality. That's a different strategy. We don't even mention drugs again in the program to them. We just teach them to love Jesus. <laughs> yes, I was a businessman, that's it. I had much money and, you know, this money, they, they all go for narcotics. You know, God healed me in one day when I cried to him. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for people and it sets them free. Then later on we bring them teaching so that they could be strong against the temptations in future. Take the bread. Today, by the grace of God and through the help of our businessmen, we feed about 2,000 people every day free of charge. We built a center where everybody could come to as a canton and sit and hear the word of God and get, get cleansed and, uh, you know, dressed, uh, given clothing and, uh, you, know, you know, treated with medicine. So we have lawyers here who we help them do their documents, we are bring them to restore them to the society. Then we find out if some of them need rehabilitation, they go to the rehabilitation center. Some of them need help, medical help, they go to the doctors. So just like that. They... The government and the people of Ukraine, even the ordinary people, they know us now. They know that every hopeless situation is being resolved in our church. So if people use to uh, poison the minds of ordinary people, if the government used to poison them through newspapers, articles before, now most of the people in Kiev are positive about us because they know of the work we have done. Because some of them know so there are people, their friends or relatives that have been to the church and God has helped them. So they are really positive. Most people now feel we are doing at least a good job. Sunday's church has grown to over 20,000 members. Different rehabilitation clinics have started out of this church, 
with more than 3,000 people being set free from drugs and alcohol addiction. Several orphanages have been set up through the activities of Sunday and his staff. Thousands of Mafia members have received Christ, their lives to be totally changed. The members of Sunday's church, the Embassy of God, have had a profound influence on the entire cross-section of society. What started out as an impossibility is now actually happening. Previous skeptic politicians and members of the Senate have witnessed the change that Sunday's work has had on society and are now frequently seen attending the Embassy of God. God started using them as our spokesman, you know. Now we don't need to talk, now we don't need to act. They are acting for us. They are the ones saying, oh, we know this man, we've been there, we know what he's doing. And through those people, God started like defending us and vindicating us. My life is relationship with God, you know, yeah, working with God. And every other thing is like a hobby to me. So if people are really hungry for God, what they should begin to look for is not the success or the growth or the achievements or the fruits of, 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 of ministry. I think they should first of all make God their God, their meat, their meal, their daily bread, their life. They should just make God, they should just uh, encircle themselves with God. That is what Jesus was trying to tell us when he said, that you seek first the kingdom of God. If we can do that, we will not have problem with growth, with success, with, with achievements. He loves to give his time. He loves to give his heart, his soul. He loves to give anything that he can give to help, you know, to help people and to make the world a better place. It's very risky. It takes a lot of risk. Sometimes some are good, sometimes some are bad. But that's life, you have to risk. Uh, when I see people's life change, it's like I'm paid by salary. It's like uh, I am comforted that it's worth doing. doing. But I'm not relax, like, relaxing just because some people's lives was changed. Each, each person I see that is changed and testifying is a push to me to make me to know that there's many others out there that need to be changed. So I'm not relaxing on that, I'm not stopping on that. I'm thinking of how many more are out there that need to be touched and affected. Thank you for being with us today. You have been watching a program from the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God for all nations in Kyiv, Ukraine.